Hi booktube! I hope you're all doing well. I hope you don't mind, but I decided to skip my normal intro today because I am so behind. I've been working on my website, putting in the illustrated versions of the classic that I decided to choose for this winter, and I am just not finished yet, and it's February 29th today. And <laughs> Oh, by the way, happy Leap Day! And I wanted to get it out by the end of February, and it looks like it's probably going to be at least one day late. Anyway, I just thought I would do a casual chat. I needed a break. I needed to switch focus for a second and see you guys and check in with you guys. And I thought what I would do is I would talk about the books that I've been reading over both January and February because I have quite a few good ones here. Before I start, real quick, I wanted to show you some of the interesting things I came across. So my Illustrator Explorer was on the illustrated versions of Snow White, the standalone versions of Snow White. And I have a couple of here that I wanted to show you. First of all, I wanted to show you this one because it's the first time that Snow White was published as an illustrated standalone. It was illustrated by Franz Jutner, I think. The problem is, is I can't find any real definitive information to say 100% yes, this is true, <laughs> but this is the best I can come up with. This was published in 1905. I just wanted to show you these old, old illustrations. Whenever I start these explorers, I always start with the original the other one I wanted to show you was, I think this is my favorite adapted version. It's retold by Josephine Poole and illustrated by Angela Barrett, and I picked this up at my library. It's really cool. There are, as you probably know, some pretty gruesome <laughs> details on the original Snow White. This one did a really good job of sanitizing those details, but doing it in a way that was still really interesting. And this illustrator is just phenomenal with some images that you don't normally find in the Snow White tale. Here is she dancing with her father. And then if you look closely, you can see the wicked stepmother over there across the way looking through the window. You see this one, which is the mom at the window, and she is embroidering and she pricks her finger and there's blood that falls on the snow. And then another pivotal moment in the story with the page being dissected by a wall and this time the evil queen is handing Snow White the apple. I thought that was neat how Angela Barrett had organized that interesting symbolism. I also wanted to show you what is probably my favorite version of all the Snow Whites, and that's this one by Bernadette Watts. North South Publishing kindly sent me this, and I think it's so pretty. I think I've mentioned on this channel before, Bernadette Watts is a very well-known illustrator in Europe and her works mostly cover folk tales and fairy tales. So there's that one with Snow White at the beginning. And I love the little details too, like the bird here. Here's another one that I just, they're so rich and detailed, and I love the colors. Then I have to show you the very end. Oh, this is a nice, beautiful spread you might be interested in too. Isn't it gorgeous? But at the very end, when it finishes off the tail, there's this little box with this with one of the dwarves pointing down, and that's so cute. If you are interested in the illustrated versions of Snow White and all the history and some write-ups on the illustrators as well as links is where you can purchase them, head over to my website. I'll put the link below. And there's so many beautiful versions. Um, I was amazed at how gorgeous some of the versions are. But yeah, well, okay, so time to get started with what I've been reading over February, and I've got a couple of titles here from January as well. So let me take a sip of my hot cocoa, and we'll get started. The first one that I want to show you was actually a book that I picked up from my library's book stacks on my Instagram account. Every month I will choose a book from the back of the library, and I'll photograph it at the end of the month and put it on my Instagram account, which I still haven't done yet, but it's coming. And that book is Eleanor Farjan, The Silver Curlew. It's a Rumpelstiltskin or Tom Tit Tot um, retelling. Tom Tit Tot is an English version of the German Rumpelstiltskin, where instead of asking for the baby, uh, Tom Tit Tot wants to take the actual queen. That is our snowplow, by the way, if you heard that. <laughs> We had a little bit of snow this morning. This book is magical and it's also really funny. I laughed so hard sometimes and there were so many times when I just found myself 
feeling so cheered by this book. <laughs> we have a mom and she has her children. She has two boys and two girls, but the boys kind of don't really play into the story very much. So I'll just talk about the two girls. We have Doll and we have Paul. Paul is in kind of short for Polly. And um, Doll is really pretty, but she's dreamy and um, not always really there. <laughs> she's always off in some la la land dreaming. And she gets put in charge of looking after these dumplings. And she decides she's going to try a dumpling and she eats one of these dumplings. And it turns out that she ends up eating all 12 of the dumplings that were meant for the family to eat. Mom comes home, the brothers come home, and once they figure out that Doll has eaten these dumplings, they're in the middle of exclaiming about how you could eat all 12? What? All 12 of them? And then at that moment, King Nolikins, who himself is a character, is passing by and he's like, 12 of what? 12 of what? So they're too embarrassed to admit that the daughter, Doll, had eaten all 12 of these dumplings. So instead, they say, oh, she spun 12 bundles of straw into flax. So Nolikins is like, what? If you can do this, I'll marry you. And if not, then you're getting your head chopped off. <laughs> so Paul, so Doll has no choice but to try and spin these bundles. So she gets put in a room with all these bundles and then the imp shows up and he of course takes over. He spins the bundles and such a cozy read and it made me laugh. Also what's great about this is that it's illustrated by Ernest Shepard. So here's, here's King Nolikins with a nanny who's wiping his nose. I told you he was kind of a, his own character. And here's him when he's been naughty and he's standing in the corner. She sends him to the corner. <laughs> here's a typical Ernest Shepard type of illustration and those are puffins in the corner there. So yeah, I highly recommend this. I'll talk about this more definitely when I get to the end of the year and I discuss all the um, out of print books. All of a Kind Family Downtown. In this book, we follow the lives of a Jewish family, five girls and their little brother, who are living in New York's East Side. It begins in late November and it continues on until the following Thanksgiving. This, by the way, is the second in the series. It's a little bit heavier, I think, than the first one. There is a character in it who is experiencing real poverty and sickness that comes with that poverty. There's references to Aladdin. There's references to the Red Fairy book, which I thought was really cool. I don't think I've ever come across the Red Fairy book in a book reference before. Let me show you some of these illustrations, which are just adorable. There's one. This is during Purim, a concert that was going on during Purim, which is actually my favorite chapter of the whole book. I really loved that chapter. Beth and Joe Crush are, if you are familiar with the Borrowers series, they are the illustrators for that series. One of the books that my son and I have been reading, actually I have two books that my son and I have been reading here that I want to show you today. But the first one is The Abominables by Eva Ibbotson. Uh, we fell in love with Eva Ibbotson's writing when we read Journey to the River Sea, this illustrated version that we absolutely love. I actually found The Abominables when I was in Texas. My stepmother took me to a used bookstore. I think it's called Fifth and Charles, if I'm not mistaken. Eva Ibbotson is so inventive. For example, the reason that no one has ever found the abominable snowman is because their feet are backwards and when they walk, it looks like they go the other direction. <laughs> I thought that was brilliant. It's about a family of yetis who are living in Nepal and um, they decide they're going to move to England because more and more people are moving into their territory and they're afraid of discovery and what that might bring. So they travel secretly to England to what they're hoping is a safe home, which turns out to be not such a safe home. So what I loved most about it is there's tons of fairy tale references, Cinderella and Dick Whittington and his cat and, and more that I'm not even thinking of. But I also was kind of blown away when I saw the references to the chalet school, how to win friends and influence people, um, let's see, Finn Family, Moomin Troll, and Grimm's Fairy Tales, of course, and then The Jungle Book. And my son loved it. We're gonna start reading more Eva Ibbotson because he's just interested where he just, doesn't want me to stop reading and I love that 
this one is beautifully illustrated. Here's the family and they each have their own individual personality and they're just funny. So highly recommend that one. The next book that my son and I just finished reading together is Michael Ende's The Night of Wishes. Michael Ende wrote The Never Ending Story and I've been kind of curious to read his other works. He has The Night of Wishes and then he has another one that I'd like to read, Momo I think it is. We really like this. I mean it's not The Never Ending Story. It's not on that level. But it's still very interesting, it's still entertaining. And what it's about is this professor is in trouble because he has not been evil enough. And the Council for Evil Wizards put pressure on him that he now has to create a potion that is very evil before the stroke of midnight on New Year's Eve. By the way, it's said at New Year's Eve. He is joined by his aunt who tries to aid him in creating this potion. He has a cat and his aunt has a crow that she brings along and this crow and this um, cat are actually spies that are working for an agency trying to stop the evilness from happening and so they have to stop these two people before the stroke of midnight from creating this potion. What I liked about it is every chapter is headed by a time so it begins at five o'clock and then every it's it's actually not chapters it's all just clocks so there's never a chapter one or chapter two we just kind of would read one or two of the clocks and then stop there as we were going but so my son got to get a little bit of practice telling time which is always useful whenever that happens in a book i will say that the ant and the wizard bicker a lot and that got a little bit tedious at times but other than that I felt like it was a really inventive interesting bo uh, book with some elements that I had never seen before. Michael Ende is one of those authors who had created such a well-known amazing work as the never-ending story that it overshadowed all of his other works and I think that that is probably true in this case. I think it's a good story, valuable story, but it will never live up to the never-ending story. So I worry that part of me sees through that lens. I think I would probably recommend it for fans of the never-ending story, just as in something of interest to read that he's also written. Here's one of the illustrations that are inside. And I, I love um, the New York Book Review Children's a collection. I, I love these books with the red uh, cloth spine. The next book I want to show you that we read is The Great Mouse Detective, Basil of Baker Street, and it's really cute, very quick read, super thin. These two mice, Basil and Watson, hang out in Sherlock Holmes' study and listen to Sherlock Holmes solve cases. And um, he also has become a detective in the mouse world, Basil has. And so one day he is requested to help solve a case of two little mice twins who have gone missing. It's set during the winter and it is different from the Great Mouse Detective, the Disney version of the Great Mouse Detective, but it's very cute in its own right. So that's it for the books that my son and I read together. The following books that I have are just the books that I read on my own. And back in January, I read Agatha Christie's A Sleeping Murder. Gwenda moves into this house and she's busy renovating it, but she feels like a sense of familiarity with this home and she can't quite figure out why. And she also has some very negative feelings in certain areas of the home. And she goes to the theater one day and there's a scene that happens in the theater that really just triggers a memory and a really bad response as well. Like she responds to it rather emotionally. Along comes Miss Marple who helps her figure out why she is feeling this way. I find it very difficult to talk about mysteries because I'm so afraid to say something that might be telling. I love these William Morrow editions. There's this one scene where Miss Marple is gardening and she's talking about how when you're pulling weeds, she's only pulling the surface part out. There's like tons more going on underneath the surface. It made me smile when I read that for what she's meaning by this book. The next book I want to show you is an illustrated book. I first read it when I was probably 13 or 14 and it made an impression on me and stuck in my mind. And about a year ago, I suddenly had this overwhelming desire to read it again. I just really wanted to see why I love this book so much. 
And that book is The Cold Moons by Erin Clement. Before I begin, you have to kind of understand the background. So in back in the 1970s in the UK, there was an outbreak of tuberculosis within the cattle population and they found tuberculosis in the badger population. And so they started a mass extermination of badgers, even though there really was no real connection, there was no real proof that badgers actually caused the tuberculosis in the cattle, unfortunately. This is a story of a group of badgers who get warned of oncoming danger, and they make the trek across um, the UK I think is mostly set in Wales to a new place to a protected area where they will be safe. It has excellent themes of leadership, great characters, I mean they're all badgers but there's some really great distinctive characters. There's references to deities of ancient cultures. It's a fantasy novel but it's set against circumstances of reality. It even includes newspaper articles which I haven't been able to find out definitively if they were made up for the story or if they actually existed. For example, here's the Daily Chronicle, South Wales, Thursday, 23rd May. The only thing I would say maybe is that it's a bit patriarchal at times, but yet there are a couple of female characters who do stand out. And it's also, by the way, illustrated by his wife, and it's illustrated so beautifully. Here's one, for example. I was a little afraid that it would be one that I enjoyed when I was younger but just don't like anymore. And it stands up, it stood the test of time, so I'm very glad about that. Yeah, highly recommend if you're interested in some of the history of the badger. I will say it does have violence towards the badgers, so just be aware of that. Another book I read that I mentioned in my last video that I was going to read is Robin McKinley's The Hero and the Crown. This won the Newbery Award, I think it was in 1985, I want to say. I'll double check that and put it up on the screen if I'm incorrect. But, um, and I really enjoyed it. I really liked it. Um, what I love about Robin McKinley, from what I've read of her so far, is that she is just good at creating characters that you really come to care about. And I really came to care about all the characters in this book. She's also great because a lot of her female heroines exist within a male-dominated world and they have to find a way to stand out and to shine and this is very true in this book. Robin McKinley is one of those authors who I feel like she should be more talked about. Her other book is The Blue Sword that I want to read that is set in the same uh, world as this one and I believe that one was a Newbery Honor book. That one was written I think Uh, before this one. It was written in 1983, if I'm not mistaken, but it actually happens after the events in this book. So that's very interesting. I want to check it out. We have Erin, who is the daughter of a king, and um, she is different from everybody else. Her mother was from the north and kind of looks different from everybody else. Plus, her mother was also rumored to be a witch So she's treated with a lot of um, suspicion. The story really takes off when Erin figures out how to, through trial and error, how to create a balm that you can cover yourself with that makes you impervious to fire or to flame. I loved how she kind of tried this and tried that, got it wrong sometimes and burned herself. And then eventually she had that eureka moment where she figured it out. She figured out the exact formula to use. And then she, um, first she started with a small flame, then she tried, oh, let, let me go take my lunch out of the oven, be right back. Okay, so where was I? So she creates this fire and first she puts her finger over a flame and she realizes it works there. She puts it on her arm and sticks her arm into the fireplace and it works there. So she decides to go out with her horse into the wild and try running through a bonfire and then also try and see if her horse will do it with her and she smears it all over her horse and that works and so the real trial comes one day when news of a dragon that is attacking a nearby village reaches her. She secretly rides out to um, confront this dragon and in this world we live in we have very very bad dragons like a Smaug type dragon like in The Hobbit. There's also romance in it, but it is not the main focus of the book. I think, honestly, the best relationship in this book is 
Erin's relationship with her horse, Talat. I think that relationship is just the most beautiful relationship. If you're a horse person and you enjoy books about horses, I think you'll like this one. The horse is such a strong character himself who goes with her everywhere on this journey that she has to take. And I don't want to say much more because I don't want to tell you too much about it. Like I said before, Robin McKinley, she writes these characters and they're so interesting and you can just really start to love these characters. So when I closed the book, I was honestly sad. I, was, I felt like I'm really going to miss them. <laughs> the final book is by Baroness Ortsy. It's The Scarlet Pimpernel. I love this book so much. I'm completely and utterly enchanted. So we have here the beginnings of the superhero trope as we know them today. We have a hero with an alter ego. This hero has a, a mode of transportation that is somewhat of a character in itself. There's a lady, a, a love interest that requires saving. And there is an arch nemesis. In this case, it's Chauvelin. It's set during the time period of the French Revolution, during the Reign of Terror when the French aristocracy was facing execution by Madame Guillotine and it was a very scary time. It's basically the aristocracy and their families and children just being murdered. Along comes the League of the Scarlet Pimpernel led by a mysterious person who is the Scarlet Pimpernel. What I think I love about this not only is it um, the beginnings of the superhero trope as we know it today but it's also a romance between a married couple but it's just as romantic as if they were not married or if they had just met also what i like about this is about four or five chapters in it changes perspective where it's coming from marguerite's perspective and then the rest of the story is told from marguerite's perspective and after i read this i went and watched the movie with jane seymour and I love that movie. It has a different ending, and I honestly can't tell you which ending is better. I know that the ending in the Scarlet Pimpernel movie, I think is based off of another of the Scarlet Pimpernel books by Baroness Ortsy called El Dorado. Um, she wrote a few Scarlet Pimpernel related books, and I am actually very interested to check those out. I think I might try El Dorado next. This was actually a play before it was turned into a book. So when you read it, you kind of get that feeling that it's kind of that interstage left kind of feeling. You can sort of sense that feeling of a location being established before the characters play in it, that kind of thing. But yeah, I just really, really love this. H. M. Brock illustrated the Scarlet Pimpernel. But there you go. Oh, and there's Baroness Ortsy on the back. Well, um, that is it. I hope you've enjoyed it. And let me know in the comments what you're reading. Um, have you read The Scarlet Pimpernel before? What did you think about it? Um, and yeah, I will see you soon. Bye, take care.